If you've only just become aware of the conversations surrounding free speech online, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's just exploded onto the scene out of nowhere, taking everyone by surprise and forcing people to spontaneously consider the principles and limits of free speech in a way that perhaps they never before have. This is important philosophical territory which has been thrown into the public discourse within the framework of social media with all its power to control information and communication at a scale never before seen in human history. In many ways, it's a shame that the banning of Donald Trump was the most high profile example of social media censorship because some, actually many, seem to be using their opinion on the Trump ban as the barometer for their opinion on the broader issue overall. But this conversation has been rumbling away for a few years now and it will no doubt continue for a few years more. So it's essential that we're all able to approach this conversation with an open mind because moments after the Trump ban, one of Twitter's investors tweeted, if you can silence the king, you are the king. But the CEOs of big tech companies are yet to give a second thought, it would seem, for the many millions of people who haven't yet cast their ballot in regards to how happy they are to be ruled by them. If you've spent any time online in recent weeks, or actually, if you've even tentatively dipped your toes into this conversation, you'll have no doubt come across some of the more regularly repeated arguments in defense of big tech censorship. One of them, which many millions of people have uttered in unison over recent weeks, is the proposition that they're a private company, they can do what they want. Another version of the same argument is to compare the use of social media to a night out at the pub. You break their rules, you get kicked out, or perhaps you've stumbled across my personal favourite, which is freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequence. Freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequence, a sentence which, in many contexts, simply doesn't add up. After all, if one of the consequences of free speech is the punishment of not being able to speak anymore, then you would have to argue that the culprit never enjoyed the liberty of free speech to begin with. When I hear people say it's a private company, they can do what they want, I often get the distinct impression that the entire premise of the conversation is being misunderstood. The essence of this debate isn't about whether or not they have the legal right to yield such influence. After all, for example, when we talk about the fact that 120 million acres of the Amazon rainforest have been destroyed by multinational logging companies, we rarely jump to their defence by pointing to the legality of their actions. Or when we read about the fact that child slaves in the Democratic Republic of Congo are breaking their backs down mines to provide the lithium-ion batteries for our smartphones, we don't pull out those same smartphones just to hop on Google and double check that their labour is taking place within the moral framework of a private company. So similarly, when a very small group of men in California completely alter the global framework within which we communicate and gain so much control and power that they're able to dictate on our behalf what constitutes acceptable information and speech. It's fair to say the fact they're a private company is only a very small part of the conversation. It's certainly not the checkmate that some seem to think it is, because like it or not, social media is the marketplace of ideas. It's where politicians announce government business, it's where news breaks and is discussed, and it's where people stay in touch with their wider network of friends. So being exiled from social media, it's less like being kicked out of the pub and more like being exiled from the public square. Because at least when you're kicked out of one pub, you have the freedom to try your luck at another. Which brings me to my final point. In the last month alone, the YouTube channel of the mainstream Ofcom regulated talk radio was removed from YouTube for consistently questioning anti-lockdown policy. A few days later, the Twitter account of the Chinese embassy in the US was blocked for misrepresenting the oppression of Uyghur women after a huge backlash where many pointed out the incompetent nature of Twitter's content moderation. And just over a week ago, the Facebook page of the Socialist Workers' Party, which is one of the largest left-wing organisations in the UK, was taken offline and dozens of its activists remain banned from the platform without explanation. 
The dictatorial, haphazard, scattergun nature of big tech censorship is beyond doubt, and yet there are still many who choose to say, if you don't like their rules, you can go elsewhere. If you don't like the platform, you're free to find alternatives. And yet, when an alternative does crop up, the social media monopoly has no hesitation in crushing the opposition, making any viable competition more or less impossible. The closest competitor to Twitter was an app called Parley, which before being unceremoniously dumped from the internet had gained 15 million users by marketing itself as a free speech focused alternative to mainstream social networks. Earlier this month, the Parley app was lambasted across mainstream media for allegedly being the platform where a number of right-wing extremists planned the attack on the Capitol Hill building in Washington. First, the app was dropped from the Google Play Store, shortly followed by the App Store, before finally being blocked by Amazon Web Services, causing the entire Parley app to be completely unavailable anywhere on the internet. Meanwhile, Twitter was also in the news for allowing a child pornography video to stay online for over a month, racking up 150,000 views, while the 16-year-old victim, who was 13 at the time of filming, begged the website to have the video taken down, only to be told that Twitter does not find a violation of the company's policies, until a federal agent intervened and demanded the footage be removed. In fact, there are dozens, hundreds of examples of questionable, controversial, misleading content to be found and remained active on Twitter every single day. And yet, when a rival social media app is accused of the same, it is exiled en masse with very little hesitation. As one Twitter user stated, Twitter could just as easily find that the whole site incites violence and ban itself. But of course, it's one rule for the big tech companies and another rule for the smaller firms that dare to compete with it. So yes, they're a private company. They're a private company that have created a brand new phenomenon which is altering the very fabric of our future. And the fact that they're a private company should not place their decisions beyond our scrutiny.